capitalisms. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Gary Hall. I'm an urban designer. Um, I'm on the um, Design Midlands uh, Design Review panel, um, as, as well as a couple of others. And I have a kind of background and history in large scale urban extensions, lots of work around design coding, which has obviously become kind of a bit of a kind of hot topic at the moment in the in the uh, national design world. Um, and yeah, so I've been chairing some of these webinar sessions and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Um, Christy, I'm going to go to you next. Do you want to just say a little bit about who you are and what you're interested in? Yeah, I'm Chrissy Tinsley. I'm a landscape architect and also environmental manager. I worked for years in groundworks in the East Midlands and started work with Leicester City Council 13 years ago. My claim to fame is as the inaugural national suds champion. Um, and I work closely with the Arbury culturalists at Leicester City to achieve street trees in the city. Lincoln, I'm going to come to you next. Do you want to just um, say a quick introduction and... Uh... Yep, just get off mute. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Lincoln Garland. I've been working as an ecologist in uh, environmental consultancy, uh, academic research and wildlife NGOs for the last 25, 30 years. Uh, I now work for Biodiversity by Design based in the Southwest. I'm particularly interested in urban ecology and design and worked on many residential and other urban development projects in the UK and overseas. Um, I'm a regular contributor to the Nature of Cities platform and recently um, wrote two chapters for Routledge's new handbook of urban ecology. Most recently, I've, I've been uh, focused on ecotourism, conservation strategies in Southeast Asia and the Middle, Middle East. Um, but perhaps the biggest street tree urban round project I've, I've worked on in the UK was Stratford Athletes Village for the 2012 London Olympics, where we, we helped ensure 70% of the trees were wildlife value. I hope in, in this webinar to, to say a few words on biodiversity net gain and street planting, because uh, that's a, it's a hot new topic and uh, I think it's worth, worth talking about. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Fiona, last but not least. Um, I'm Fiona Heron. I'm a landscape architect. I've got um, experience, 11 years experience in local authority on both design and implementation and also working in the planning department at, at Nottingham City before moving into private practice. So now work as a landscape architect, my own practice where I do um, design implementation and, and public art, but I do quite a lot of consultancy work. Uh, I've got commitment to green infrastructure and strategic. I do quite a bit of strategic advice really on spaces and green, green infrastructure. So. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, we'll be hearing uh, more from Fiona in, in a moment because we've, got a, we've actually got a, a presentation. I'm just gonna quickly share this. Can you all give me a thumbs up if you've suddenly seen a presentation turn up on the screen? Perfect. So here we are, we're at webinar three. Um, and I'm hopefully, um, if you didn't get a chance to check out the previous webinars in this series, um, then they're available online to view. They're definitely very, um, I found them very interesting anyway. I particularly enjoyed the one on uh, cycling infrastructure. I know that's another thing that's uh, coming to the fore. Um, so, yeah, this is us today. Uh, the, the first one, um, for those who missed it, was about the new National Model Design Code. Um, and again, that was a uh, interesting eye-opening I think discussion with our panel about um, well just the way the where planning is going and the tools that are going to they're going to shape it I have to do a bit of sales pitch on who design midlands are hopefully you all know who we are because um, you're here at our webinar but if you're not familiar with what the organization does um, we're a we're one of the um, national design review panels um, we do extensive amounts of training and professional development. So um, this is kind of part of that program. We've, we've got a good range of experience. I've worked on and off with Design Midlands now for 10 years or so, working on things like neighborhood plans, planning support. And as Fiona's mentioned, who is also a panel member, we do work, work around art in the built environment. Um, we're here today though, to talk about the role of trees and trees in our built environment and in our urbanized areas. Um, Fiona's going to talk about this in more detail, but we do have a new draft paragraph in the MPPF which brings to the fore um, the well, the, well, the national planning policy requirement to provide 
tree line streets and that for anyone who's been working in the built environment especially over the last 10 or so years as belts have been tightened it's a real challenge to deliver street trees um, and the fact that, that, we're, that we're seeing that within the MPPF now and, and reflected again in the National Model Design Code is an interesting shift and I think it provides us with a lot of opportunities but a, a lot of challenges as well. Um, we're going to have the structure of the day is essentially we're going to be hearing, so here are the two documents, sorry, that are um, kind of setting the scene and they're both out for consultation at the moment, but the National Model Design Code and the, the, the MPPF together are kind of certainly pushing the agenda around um, greening the urban environment. The structure of the day or this afternoon is that Fiona's got a presentation on it. I invite you to share your screen in a second, Fiona. Uh, Lincoln, you've got a few words you wanted to say as well about biodiversity. And then we'll open the floor to a question, Q&A. We, we try and keep this as conversational as possible. Um, there's no meaningful chairing, to be fair. Um, uh, but any questions that you want to put to the panel, then put them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all of them. And what we've tended to do is colour questions that we've missed and try and answer them afterwards. Um, Fiona, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, do you want to share yours and go into your presentation? You're going to have to unmute, unmute yourself, Fiona. Can you see? Can you see the presentation? Right. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to talk for 20 minutes, very quickly, shoot through some slides for food for thought, really, um, based on the new national policy points that we're, we're going to be sort of looking at, really. Um, I'm just going to sort of move it on. Uh, but let's go. Get all the right. First of all, I'm just put this slide up really because um, I wanted really just to say, can you see the buildings? And I think it's just a question to ask that sometimes as planners, we spend a lot of time on porticos and buildings, and actually sometimes you don't even see those buildings. So I, I'm just sort of raising the point as how where do we get the best value for money from? And it, it's it's something to, to consider really to think about. I'm not going to run through all the functions of trees and green infrastructure. I'm just going to put them up here very quickly. Obviously, the sustainability um, is emotional, um, nature, function, community and connectivity, all these elements they provide. And we're very much driven now by the national design agendas, really. Climate change, health and well-being and economic regeneration. I'm going to do this from a landscape architect's point of view. How can we use trees really to create meaningful spaces to maximize our opportunities and achieve value for money? We're all under tremendous pressures now. And how can we sort of maximize what we do? There's common principles that we see all the time on design reviews and when I'm consulting on documents, um, all the issues that um, reoccur really for good or bad. I'm going to perhaps run through some of those um, now. First of all, integrated thinking, early involvement, working together. Again, it's something that's so important. If we want to have spaces for trees and quality GI, we've got to really set that up right at the beginning. Uh, we've got to have the right um, experts on board. We've got to have aspirations that are common and it's got to be achievable and deliverable and I think that ties in very much with um, where we liaise with developers you know right at the outset we don't wait till application you know what are the policies that we've got in process and where do we talk to them where does the dialogue start we've already got all these tools that we've all we all know about but you know are they being used what's the commitment and I think that's the challenge really are they followed? What's the culture of the authority? We've got a new manual for streets coming, so that will be a really important tool. I think that was raised at some of the other webinars. All these things are very much interlinked, and I think it's really important that we refer to these documents. Um, it gives them added weight. We've got the new national design guide. It doesn't say anything new, but what it does, it actually brings everything together. 
and trees are not just put on one side with green public spaces, you know, now they're part of movement, identity, context. So it's a very important document that I think we can use and refer to. Important tool, I think, a key document for the future will be, as, as Gary mentioned, the National Model Design Code. This is probably what's going to be used now you know, by developers. People are going to say, if it's not in there, well, it's fine, we can get away with it. So it's really important, I think, to embed trees and other green infrastructure into this document at the beginning, um, not only in the sections that are identified, but, but throughout the, the, the document. The clear areas, the, the, the sort of, it's green, it references green infrastructure, water and drainage, and biodiversity. So I think it's, it's, this is a real opportune point to actually make sure we've got, we've got trees in at this point. Local sort of policy documents, um, different organisations, different local authorities have different approaches. And again, it's, it's policy and how these processes are implemented that's really important. Um, you know, we've got development briefs and it's really important at the development brief to get in what, what are the functions of trees. They need to be in that, at that early stage and, and they are in some, some organisations. Nottingham City Council have their own charter for quality. They have a um, documents where they identify key players. They have a sort of traffic light criteria where you tick the boxes and they have a system of timing to agree certain principles. Um, Cambridge have a, a quality growth charter where they actually look at um, quality. They identify that they want exemplars for climate change on all new schemes putting points like these in documents that can be referred to and reinforced give added, added weight to trees. We don't always have the resources to do these documents ourselves, but most local authorities, most people are quite happy for you to use their documents and um, develop from them because we're all committed for the same thing really. Tree replacement standards, different um, organisations have different approaches. Bristol had an approach where actually it wasn't a one for one tree replacement. It was based on girth size, canopy size. Um, Sefton tree um, in Liverpool, they were looking at actually how many trees per house you replaced. Um, Birmingham had a tree bond where it was a levy from the environmental energy, which was match funded. So again, that's tied in with climate change, the, the real drivers that we're looking at. So adoption, really, I think it's a big issue, <laughs> how we deal with streets, what the problems are, what the issues are. One well, question I would raise that's in this new policy document, it says all street trees and existing trees to be retained wherever possible or if appropriate. I mean, I think that's something we need to really look at. And if we're being asked to consult, I think those things need to be defined really, <laughs> because it's, very easy to say, well, it's not possible or, oh, it's not appropriate. So I'd be quite, I'm quite concerned about that statement, really, sort of a get out clause. Um, working with highways is one of the most important, well, we can't do streets without highways. And I think, again, who is the street for? Um, what's the hierarchy of the street? And I think now there are new documents coming out about streets and we've got to work together, really, and actually, there is weight in some of those documents now for trees. So I think these are opportunities that we, we've got to push and engineers like clarity and the model design code will perhaps give us clarity and maybe that's something that they don't like wishy-washy statements that perhaps they think is, is not appropriate. So I think that's an area that we can look at. Working with others is, a, is something that politics is, politicians are very keen on now and collaboration, you know, how can we do that? Well, you know, there needs to be a level of trust and achievability. How viable is it? We've got to really look at mutual benefit dialogue, really, but be very clear what the outcomes are and the outcomes and communicate these. And a lot of um, developers and companies have got very good communication strategies. They've got very complex social media, graphic skills. So 
we can use them for interactive um, communication so people don't say well I can't get to that town hall in miles away on a Wednesday afternoon you know I think there's real opportunity to use the resources that, that we've got community consultation really um, everybody loves trees but you know people don't always realize what the problems are with street trees so you know I think there's a real opportunity to maximize and have a shared vision and promote what we're trying to do too we want councillors on our side really and to understand the big issues certain organizations have trained councillors to climate change and some of the broader issues really Three champions, Hackney were very successful in identifying people, um, giving them a tree, saying you look after it, and that was a very successful scheme. We've got community groups and schools, so I think really let's try and use who, who we've got. Design review, I sit on design review, but often, you know, we're really stretched for time and resources as, as authorities. So, you know, use design review in whatever format it is, that, you know, in very many different formats. Involve, I say a landscape architect, purely because it, need, it needs to be a strategic overview of green space and green infrastructure. So, you know, if you can commit it to the green framework, get someone who's got expertise in green issues um, in the environment and, you know, that can really benefit your scheme at an early stage. Again, other support and research. We've got practitioners and suppliers who supply trees and everything that goes with them and they're dying to put them in, but they're actually really good and they know their stuff and they're very experienced. So I think we should be using them because they are very good and committed. Um, secondly, the Tree Design Action Group, um, have produced a document some quite some time ago now, the Trees in the Townscape, a guide for decision makers. Um, this is a really valuable document which identifies 12 key principles that support trees. Uh, it has an explanation of delivery mechanisms, examples of principles, and links to further references. So it, it's very helpful, for example, you know, knowing your trees having a comprehensive strategy, embedding trees in policy, and it identifies who are the key players, how you can perhaps do this, it gives you examples. And it does the same with design, it's looking at tree-friendly places, picking the right tree, seeking multiple benefits, you know, the climate change agenda, that's where you can get resources and funding and asset management, and how you can do this. And then it goes through to plant protection and management and monitoring. So that's, that's a very useful document. I think one of my experience is, is that if you don't have a quality vision, you, you'll never get a great space. And I think right at the beginning, there needs to be a really strong vision to create a unique place. And what drives that philosophy? And that's driven by context inside the site and outside the site. And that's on a whole host of of different levels, practical, emotional, physical, and, and historical, um, which that helps to inform the character. And then how does landscape contribute to the character and make place, create identity? And then actually, what are these spaces for? Um, what is the planting for? And how does it tie in? What does it do? Does it reinforce, enhance, or integrate? Um, does it provide a hierarchy and navigation? All those functions that we're always looking at. You can't consider good trees without infrastructure. It's all got to be embedded right at the outset to ensure you've got the right size spaces. And it isn't just about the size of the space or the number of spaces, it's making sure it's the right space. The right area. So it's how these all tie in together. I'm going to go through these points really um, to identify, I think the questions that we should be looking at when we see a tree on a plan, you know, any green dot all round circle, you know, what are the functions of those, um, the context, the hierarchy, you know, whether they're in single or in group, um, 
whether they're focal points, are they landmarks? You know, what are they doing? What are your trees actually doing? And I think that's a question I would always say, why is it there? What is it doing? And You know, where is it? I mean, I've seen plans like this that people have said, oh, can you have a look at that and see what you think? Well, you know, really that's a lot of circles on a plan that really half of them won't be able to be on that plan. Um, you don't really know what they do, which the big ones, which the small ones. Uh, so it, it's meaningless really. And so, you know, we move on to the next step. Oh, here we are, we've got much more detail. But again, you know, who, what landscape architect is really going to have the time to go through that bed and that bed and that bed and that bed and look at that. It's just not practical. You know, we don't know whether these are just leftover plants from another job or, or whatever. So a tree strategy is a really important document that I think on every scheme, we, we always say we, we'd like a tree strategy, a landscape strategy. And really it just identifies what the dots are. For example, you know, this plan's got a lot of trees on, but actually, um, you know, here's a space here that's associated with his care home. Now, big trees are something that is a, a real strong need to put large trees in. There's not enough large trees in the landscape. This is a corner point. It's an opportunity to create a focal point, a landmark feature. You know, do we want three small trees or is that a big opportunity? Is there a hierarchy, a street hierarchy between that street and that street? Is this, this is a different development. So, you know, are we going to have a different grouping of streets there? So people will recognize it as their home. This is a supermarket. Do you want trees all the same all around it? Do you want bigger trees, do you want smaller trees? This is a, a smaller residential area. So I think there's an opportunity for everybody to have their own sense of place really. So they can identify where they are and use landscape. So, Really, I would just say there's broader policies. Um, Newcastle has a, a tree strategy. Other organisations have tree strategies, which are much more broad about their trees. But project specific strategies, I think, really important. It's just identifying on each scheme, you know, whether it's a street tree, a feature tree, or ornamental tree, or whatever. You don't need to say what species it is, but what's the scale of it? What are the groupings of it and why are they there? And I think that is the, the biggest thing I'll say, why is that dot on that plan? Um, street hierarchy, you know, very important. Again, you know, what is the tree hierarchy that's ties in with the strategy? How can that be reinforced to make it tree friendly right at the outset? You know, do we need to look at shared ducts? What is the landscape framework? And what is the hierarchy of trees, you know, so that we actually get a proper strategy so just moving on to a few more photographs now. Um, some quite good examples, I think, of street trees, well considered at the outset. Different trees, you know, for different, different reasons, um, serving different functions, very practical, crossings, um, consideration at the outset for underground treatment for roots, you know, really needs to be thought through right at the beginning. Safety, you know, making people feel safe. We, if we want encouraging walking strategies, we need to make places that are comfortable, easy to navigate. Um, street trees, do they have to be all the way along the street? How does it combine with other green spaces and other open spaces? Lots of different opportunities. Um, very simple example here, I thought worked quite well. Nothing sort of special, but actually the trees are identifying that gateway the hedging, very much, very simple, an approach to the play area, open and simple and not complicated. Integrated landscape work, works well, I think. This was built in the last year. I mean, I, I don't think we probably need to say much about that, but you know, there's no, I, we can't be, you know, I, there's nothing I can say about that really, except it should never happen. Um, Examples abroad, but again, considering our infrastructure, placemaking, you know, there's lots of opportunities to do very simple things. Um, large trees, really important. It's a big issue now. Nobody's putting large trees in. You know, we've got, and it's really important that some local authorities are putting them in 
their documents to say we need large trees, you know, unless, uh, uh, unless otherwise stated. The impact that this existing tree makes, very simple, you know, they've, they've adjusted the land form, you know, in a very simple way, uh, works um, on this scheme. Again, they've made it the feature. You don't need a big piece of sculpture if you've got a tree like that, really. Um, again, another approach in the development briefs, this is a cordia, very nice example um, of space. Space here, really, this tree could be like that in you know, 10, 20 years, real, real lost opportunity. Um, and again here, you know, what, what do those really function? What, how, you know, what's the value of those trees? We've got three trees, but it's not just about number, it's about canopy size. Um, again, public squares, you know, we can still have big trees um, in combination with, with other trees, you know, we can still have space. We could have one big tree rather than lots of little trees, you know. Um, there'd be diverse issues that, that we'll be perhaps discussing later. Uh, another different approach, you know, much smaller trees, but more of them. Um, so um, I would say keep well away from trees in pots. The, 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 rarely have I seen them survive. It shows a lack of commitment, really. It's a problem afterwards. Orchards, food, trees, well, we've got, um, can you, can you, people still hear me? I'm just getting, um, yeah, a, a, an email. Um, flexible approach, you know, I think we can have a flexible approach to how trees, they don't just have to be in allotments. This is a really nice example of fruit trees in a new development that, you know, the tr apple, they're apple trees, they can easily be picked, they're not causing any problems to anyone. Canopy size, parking areas, you know, let's consider sometimes we see loads of trees, but they're all small upright trees. But, you know, I think this is quite a nice example. And, you know, when these trees grow really big, there'll be, you know, this will be a green space that you can park under. And I think that's how we could perhaps be, you know, looking at, uh, at what our trees are actually providing. Um, Again, we see supermarkets being put in now. This, you know, this is on the main road, but there's not even, there's not a single tree there, except this is long tree, you know, it speaks for itself. You know, I think we have to prevent that right at the outset, really, and say, you know, be very clear as local authorities what we are expecting. Um, just on that point, I heard one of, one of the developers saying, oh, well, we get away with it in some places, but we don't get away with it here, you know, so, you know, it's up to us, I think, to set those parameters. So quite nice examples. I'm just going to shoot through now to come to the end of time. Again, you know, frontages, very simple to put trees in. You know, they can tie in with, with the frontage, but again, something that's not quite such, such expensive buildings, you know, you can easily um, improve. What are the types of trees we're putting in? Do we need to put in vestigial trees? We might be looking at shade, but I think really consider what the value of these are. We don't always need trees. If you've got, um, you know, a certain quality of building, perhaps, or you're investing in there, other green infrastructure can help. Just examples of trees that provide character, variety, play, screening, all the different functions they provide. You know, colour and continuity. This is about brightening and changing people's perceptions. You know, when they're going outside in autumn and spring and summer, the seasonal approach, and how you can create avenues and routes. And the vision. You know, this. I think this is a really interesting example. You know, some a lot of the planting ties in with the buildings, which I think you know it works really quite well. And it's it's one one example. Artwork. You know, it's lots of opportunities. You know. Sculptural trees, real trees, handkerchief trees, which are chosen for their species. Um, and last of all, I just put this in because, you know, just to say really, you know, we don't always have to sort of hide everything away. If it can be done in one city, it could be done somewhere else, really. So I've shot through that fairly quickly, really, but just to perhaps pick up some of these common principles Uncurring issues that, that we might want to sort of discuss, or, or I know Lincoln's going to talk in a, in a few minutes, but um, that's, that's 
food for thought, I think. I hope that was sort of helpful. Brilliant, um, thanks, Jane. We may we may yeah. well um, we may well come back to this um, this collection here when, in our discussion. I might try and get you to share this slide again later. Um, well, shall I share it now then? Yes. Yeah, if you stop sharing the screen for now, Lincoln, you were going to say a few words, and I'll, um, I'm looking forward to. I know you haven't got a presentation, but go ahead. The floor is yours. Yeah. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Okay. Can Can everyone hear? Yeah, great, great. Yeah, I just want to say a few words on um, biodiversity net gain and street trees because it's it's a hot new topic uh, now what the biodiversity net gain is. First of all, it's I think it's it's worth briefly describing the background the biodiversity uh, the biodiversity net gain approach which is emerging. Just to clarify, for ecological enhancement to truly mean net gain, it requires that planning authorities insist on developers guaranteeing more ecological resources following development than beforehand. Unfortunately, um, biodiversity and new development have historically been in, in confrontation. Development that has caused you know, harm to biodiversity has without doubt been more the rule than, than the, uh, the exception. So in an attempt to address this problem, the, the no net loss approach to biodiversity was originally championed, um, although this was um, only ever really an attempt in firefighting uh, habitat and species decline. So the change in policy towards seeking biodiversity net gain really started gaining momentum back in the days of um, planning policy statement nine which became government policy back in 2005. So despite what is sometimes suggested, the concept of biodiversity gain in policy is not new. It goes back some time and in fact can be traced back even further to the commitments under the UK Biodiversity Action Plan, which was a product of uh, the Rio Earth Summit and, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now moving, moving rapidly to the present time, the principle of net biodiversity gain has been, uh, that was established under PPS9, was enshrined in the new national planning policy framework. Now, planning policy has, though, been on the weak side with the obligation to achieve biodiversity gain in new developments being, you know, uh, debatable. Previously, for example, caveats have encouraged biodiversity gain wherever possible. So something which is nice, a nice thing to do if, if you can. Furthermore, the um, uh, the scale and the quality of ecological enhancement required in relation to individual developments has not uh, been clearly defined. However, biodiversity gain has received renewed momentum in the last few years. But first of all, there was a commitment under the government's 25 year plan to improve the environment. And now it seems this is to become mandatory under the forthcoming environment bill, which is making its way slowly through Parliament, delayed by the, uh, the COVID crisis. Now, under the Environment Bill, biodiversity gain, net gain, will be considered met if the biodiversity value of new development exceeds its pre-development biodiversity value by at least 10%. Now, the new Environment Bill proposes that pre- and post-development biodiversity value of a development should be calculated by reference to a biodiversity metric. Now, the biodiversity metric was originally developed by DEFRA and has been recently updated by Natural England in 2019. Basically, it's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet calculation tool. So you enter your data into it. It then assesses the biodiversity quality of your site pre and post development based on the, the type, the distinctiveness, um, the condition, size, strategic significance, and the connectivity of habitats. The calculation also takes into account the difficulty of creating or restoring habitat, i.e. the risk of failure and the time-based risk. Now, in terms of the biodiversity metric in street trees, street trees were not originally included in the, the, the earlier DEFRA biodiversity metric, although they have been integrated into the latest version from Natural England. And this, this reflects importance that is recognized in the, the amendments to the MPPF, which was, which was mentioned earlier. So any removal of street trees without place replacement needs to be factored into the biodiversity metric with the size of the, of the street tree making the key difference to how important it is to biodiversity. Now, street trees have simply in the metric 
simply been split into small, medium, and large size categories. Um, the trees present in a site, be they small, medium, or large, or combination, are then converted in an area calculation uh, for use in the metric. Now, the area calculation for street trees is worked out using uh, the, the root protection area at size to maturity. So to give you some idea of equivalence between different tree uh, size categories, one hectare could include 89 large street trees, uh, each with a root protection zone of 1.2 meters radius, I think. Now, these 89 large trees in the metric would be the equivalent to 244 medium-sized trees or 2,000 small trees. So if you lose 89 large trees and replace them with 89 small trees, in terms of the metric, you will hardly make a dent from a compensation perspective. And obviously, uh, come nowhere near in terms of biodiversity enhancement. As Fiona points out, existing tree replacement standards also recognize this. So when using the biodiversity metric as a tool to work out how to compensate for the removal of street trees, a tree that will only grow to a small size is not compensation for the loss of a large tree. Also, as discussed, the, the metric takes into account, um, as with some existing tree replacement standards, the, the, the risk of failure in terms of the difficulty of creating the habitat and scores down because of the time it takes a tree to reach maturity. Though she can't compensate for the loss of one hectare of large trees with one hectare of newly planted trees, even if they're going to eventually grow to, to the same size. Now, um, in terms of risk and time to maturity, I did a quick calculation before, before the start of this webinar using the, the biodiversity metric. I can't guarantee my figures are exactly correct, but they should be in the right ballpark. So if you're losing one hectare of a street tree, uh, you would need to replace 2.6 hectares of street trees of the same size potential to compensate, and approximately three hectares to achieve the 10% biodiversity gain that's going to be required uh, under the new legislation. So, so it would be a 200% increase in area required. So if the standards are even higher for tree replacement, existing tree replacement standards, then, then I think obviously go with that. Now, a potential weakness with the metric is that the tree value is determined by potential size only. So a large oak tree, which is huge biodiversity value, could be the equivalent of a huge London plane tree, which has far less ecological value. It seems like, like it was just too... Uh, far too difficult to include for multiple tree species in, in the, uh, the metric model. However, please note that the accompanying guidance to the new biodiversity metric does explain that the metric is not a substitute for expert ecological advice and does not override or undermine existing planning policy, including the, the mitigation hierarchy in terms of biodiversity. And so there is room to make the case when you think the outputs of your analysis do not fully reflect the likely change in value based on your good ecological experience. So uh, sorry that was a bit rushed and there were no slides, but I, I did want to, to make those points about the, uh, the biodiversity metric. Well, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, that's, that's really interesting stuff. I mean, it sounds like a massive challenge. Um, in terms of when, when you when you start running it through that that calculator, it sounds like the, the scale of the challenge becomes really quite daunting, consider, especially for those of us um, who um, have witnessed how difficult it is to get any decent quality trees on landscape, into, especially into new urban environments. Um, I would like to go to the panel with some questions, if that's OK. Um, Michael and Gary in the um, Q&A have, have asked similar questions about highway maintenance costs and the barriers to delivering street trees. Um, Chrissy, maybe if I come to you as your as our local authority uh, shill, um, what, do, what do you think the, big, the biggest barriers to delivering, well, I suppose specifically trees within the public realm and in streets are, and what do we do about them? Number one, definitely services. Not only services, but the fear that statutory undertakers won't be prepared to think of new ways to manage their services through the routes. 
In the city, in Leicester where I work, we use proprietary underground systems all the time. And we've got some excellent examples such as Mill Lane through the middle of Montfort University, where we have consistently fed the services through these underground systems. But it just feels like every time you get a new engineer or a new um, applicant, you have to start the argument all over again that yes, we know there are services beneath streets, but let's look for opportunities and let's look for new ways to solve these issues. So that's number one. And I have to say the other one is adoption and changing attitudes and, you know, huge, you get some, some people in the authority who really do want to see trees and others who just see them as a problem. And you even get um, people who see a tree near in a turning head as a huge problem. And actually, what is the width of a tree trunk? And where, where's the body of the trees way above your eye line? But so there's a lot of changing views. And I try and, and get people to come along with me rather than challenge them all the time. But it is, it is a big issue, services and adoption. Yeah, it does seem to, to me a kind of frustrating conversation I've had with uh, local highways authorities is, well, of course you can do all of this stuff and we're really happy and we really want to see all these trees and yes, they look great. Um, however, you're going to have to pay through the bloody nose if you want them. And it, it is a de facto barrier um, that it's, it feels to me that it's almost, it's not weasel words, but it's kind of, it's, it's difficult because you've got adoptions and design policy moving in opposite directions. Um, the suggestion from from Michael here is, is is the is the trick just to put the put any of this stuff into private plots. Does anyone want to talk about the role of landscape in private ownership and how that can serve the public realm? I just like to comment that one of the major house builders, when we suggested putting trees on the private plots, just said, "What's the point? They'll take them out." Blanket response. Yeah. I mean I think, you know, they can supplement other trees, but you can't, there's, there's no real commitment to them, but maybe there is opportunities, you know, with this sort of community involvement to, you know, um, are, you know ask, do people set up these approaches that have happened elsewhere, you know, do people want to treat, what tree do they want, give them a care package, if, you know, and I think it's got to be totally integrated, really, I think, otherwise you are not you know, it's just well, we've, got, we've got all those green lawns, let's put them all in there. And we know they're not really going to stay there. Really. And then people have a fear of trees. I think it's um, one of the points Chrissy made was about bringing people with you, you know. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of councillors, they get pressurised by people like, oh, we've got, we've got leaves and we've got this and we've got shade. But actually, um, the value, the asset value of trees in terms of climate change can actually um, draw funding in, you know, as we've seen in sort of examples, there's some quite good examples in, in the document that I showed you, where actually how um, organisations or authorities have used this sort of biodiversity or, um, you know, the metrics to say, well, actually, we're achieving our climate change goals by putting these trees in, therefore, it saves us elsewhere. So I think it's a combination of actually communication and encouragement, you know, and um, showing people, I think Chris's examples, you know, we don't always, even as professionals, we don't always see really good examples, you know, and if you ch show people something and it, you know, well, it happens here, you know, services, is that, is that in your standards? Is that in your local policy documents that, you know, we can put some of these I think we have to put them in our policy documents and we have to stand by them really and say well this is the approach we use so it it's not new to every person that comes along they know what is expected I, I mean a question I have because it does seem that you know maybe maybe this is just our our own little kind of thought bubble here that is not representative of the wider world but it does seem that if you were to take a kind of straw poll of people in the street, they would say as tree lined streets or streets with strong landscape um, are just inherently, I mean, I don't particularly like using the word beautiful in a kind of context of urban design, but I understand where government is going with putting that, that term in. Yet it does seem that we are, we are setting up delivery mechanisms 
that are diametrically opposed to actually putting any of this stuff in place, um, be it adoptions, be it kind of the inability to control what happens with landscape in, the, in private ownership, that kind of thing. Um, do you, I mean, I'm, I'm reading here, a lot of people are in the questions are sort of, you know, highways are getting a bit of a bashing here, but I do have some sympathy with highways in that they haven't been given the money to look after this stuff. And it's, it's one thing to deliver it. It's another thing to um, protect it in perpetuity and ensure that it remains viable and safe and, you know, well maintained. So what needs to happen, do you think, um, in terms of, of that kind of issue? Uh, is it fair to lump this on developers? Someone, Lisa Guess has put, you know, did, should, we, should we be asking a thousand pounds per tree commuted sum? I mean, in my experience, when you say anything like that, they'll the number of trees on the on the on a master plan just gets reduced in line with the original landscape budget. Not oh well, we have to bump up a bit more money for landscape. It's like no, the trees come out. So maybe commuted sums are, are are actually a perverse kind of incentive. They don't really push us in the right direction. Can I just very quickly go back to a point made earlier? What is the evidence that people? take out trees if, if they're given a tree in their front garden, is there any evidence that they take it out? I mean, my, my experience is that, that people welcome, the majority of people welcome a tree in their front garden and, uh, you know, perhaps a few do take it out, but uh, is, is that just an excuse to not do it? Well, they, um, I, well, I think they should be challenged and say, well, what is the evidence that uh, you suspect that everyone's gonna chop down the, the tree in their front garden? I think it's about right tree, right place. I've got an ongoing um, issue at the moment with somebody who wants to take, to take out a street tree to create a parking place um, on his front garden. So, you know, it would be lovely if everybody did appreciate trees in their gardens, but I think sometimes other factors override that. So right tree, right place, definitely. Yeah, I think I, I'd agree with that. And I also think it's not always about the number of trees. I think, you know, often you see a lot of, uh, you can see a lot of trees on a on a plan but you think do you really need all those trees and they're all in the park somewhere you know and actually maybe if you know sometimes if you've got a big open space would it be better to have a sort of three meters knocked off that open space to have a wider street elsewhere you know and but it's ring marked as this is the open space and these are the streets but you know i think it's having that flexibility to say well actually you know what what trees are we putting in and why are we putting them in and you know it, it's what every circle is and what how does it perform as Chris Chris said I think it's not always about the number you know I sometimes sit in and say well we don't really need all those trees and people look at you in horror and think oh you don't need those trees but actually you want the right tree the right size uh, and you know and in the right place. And it's not necessarily about the numbers. I and mean, it's about creating space that's in the right place and not just green bits on the plan that we're going to green put wash. a tree in there, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the questions and it, I think, and it's, it's understandable, the MPPF obviously the, is, is quite specific in terms of requiring, should these draft amendments go through, requiring tree-lined streets and, either by design or accidentally um, that has a very specific meaning in people's minds um, and we do know that that's the hardest place to put trees trees in open I take your point Fiona that placing you know good specimen trees a good the right size tree into large open space where they're not going to have um, the, the problems around being sensitive to I don't know reflected light off of hard surfaces or whatever issue you might have with putting a kind of larger scale tree into a more urban environment but the MPPF is 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 essentially judging by the, the comments here and I'd, I'd agree with them kind of challenging highways almost directly it's sort of saying look we need to do this in this particular space and it's it's streets it's not parks it's not necessarily gardens how do we how do we crack that and is this something that that is going to have to just be a, a kind of um I don't know a bit of a sea change in terms of how we deal with highways in general I think there's a silo thing here that um, highways are in one area and some of the other services that public authorities deliver are in another. There's been a lot of work recently, a um, particular research project by Montfort University, 
about the psychological benefits of street trees. Now, the highways don't get ticks for delivering psychological benefits. That comes into health and welfare. And it also works out over time. So there's got to be a change in how you place your budgets and how you value things so that highways don't bear the brunt of it, but it's shared among services that might benefit. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think Phil Smith also made a point that front gardens actually are quite small and you won't really get trees and you'll end up getting all these little upright trees that don't really look like trees. And I think, you know, I think this is really positive. We, we can be negative and say, oh, well, you know, we're not, we're not going to achieve this, as somebody said. But actually, it's great that it's there. And now, you know, we're, we can stand up and say, look, we want this. This is what it is. And you know, my view is that you, maybe you have less, you know, you do have a smaller part, you identify that the street is part of the open space. You know, the street isn't a road and then you've got a green space. You know, the street is the public open space, which we're making attractive, walkable, cyclable, um, it's sense of character and identity. So the, the I think that's the perceptions that right at the outset, and we might say, well, that means we have other spaces that might be compromised or smaller or whatever, but I think we have to really push that. I think someone's also raised the point about how do you repurpose a tree? Um, I think as some of the examples I showed you, I think it, it's on each um, merit. You know, you look at that scheme and you see what tree that what value that tree has, how can you incorporate it into the document? If you've got principles and policies that you want to maintain existing trees, you know, you have to justify what you're, what you're going to do if you do get rid of them, really. Um, so there's a, a presumption against getting rid of trees rather than just, well, it's old and, you know, it's, they're all old and they're, you know, they're dying. Because that's what everyone says, they get somebody to look at them and say, well, they're, they're all old and they're rotten, you know, they're not safe. Well, you know, I think if you've got a, a, an approach and a strategy, you look at those things you, and your policies identify that maybe this one can be lost or what you're going to replace it with, you know, 10 other ones or, you know, one big one, or do you design a court ride around it like some of these examples that we've seen earlier on? Mm. Just, just to re-emphasize uh, what I was saying earlier about biodiversity net gain, if there's a mandatory commitment to achieve 10% net gain of biodiversity in relation to new developments, this, this is an important driver for, for uh, integrating street trees into new developments. Developers are going to be uh, looking at every opportunity they can to, to squeeze in more biodiversity, uh, to, to meet that requirement. And uh, so, so we should use this as much as possible to try and incorporate street trees into new designs. It's, it's, a, it's an important tool, which I think is going to help us moving forward. Yeah, there's a kind of question about the kind of space requirements. There's a sort of, I'm just, I can't answer any, every individual question. There are too many now. We've only got a few minutes. But there's a general kind of theme people are talking about. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, the questions could be sort of uh, grouped into is, is are we just going to need to make more space for this stuff or is it stuff that we can integrate into the spaces we're already committed to deliver and i'm thinking about specifically about wider streets that may also have to accommodate suds they may also have to accommodate cycle infrastructure are we entering into an era where wider streets and wider street corridors including the front gardens are going to be required to get this stuff in Well, I, I think, you know, I don't think that's a problem if we're looking at new means of transport and sustainable spaces and people walking from their homes, especially with COVID and all these things, then, you know, if we want our streets to be quality spaces, we might have to widen them, um, but we've got to be working together to, to and, and you know, it's the perceptions of what are those streets. They're actually, you know, public spaces which allow for different forms of movement and, are places, you know, to the manual for streets, all those those principles really. Um, yeah. And that means, I, sorry. So I, I think, Gary, it's, it's a really good point. And it's it's viewing streets in a different way, that they're not just there to, to uh, 
convey vehicles, they're multifunctional. Uh, they, they're there to attenuate flood water, to absorb pollutants, to provide green space. And if you start seeing them as multifunctional, then that is a greater argument for, you know, a, a allowing perhaps a bit more space to incorporate these things. I'm just conscious of time and wrapping up. Quite a few people have sort of said here about um, this, this kind of fear about the kind of loss of trees and how you might try and get this stuff in and, and uh, kind of uh, legislated for. Is the environment, Lincoln, Lincoln, this is probably to you, is the Environment Act the kind of stick here to get this stuff delivered on the ground? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm. Um, going over what I, what I said earlier, so apologies, but I, I, I do think that is a driver. It, it provides that mandatory requirement to achieve 10% biodiversity gain for new developments. And as part of that, there's probably going to be a commitment that uh, that 10%, that, that, that biodiversity gain, you have to manage it, you have to ensure that it's there for the next 30 years. Um, so that's, that's going to be a commitment um, which, which developers will have to make. And it, it is, it's going to be a strong tool, I hope. I mean, it's still to get through Parliament, but it looks like it's going through. It looks like the government's committed to it. And, you know, it might not be perfect, but uh, it could be a big improvement on, on where we are at the moment. And to have that legislative driver uh, promoting street trees um, can only be a good thing. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, regarding them as a, as a uh, as asset, an asset really, an asset management and how they can provide that. And other local authorities have done that, Tor Bay and other places, they've looked at actually what they are valuing and how much they can, um, you know, benefit climate, you know, tick all their climate boxes. And I think it's it's really about actually looking at that and saying, okay, well, this, this is an agenda that we can actually use and that they're a positive asset you know, how much carbon dioxide do they mean? Can we, you know, when we prune them, do we use their cuttings to, do we sell them? Do we use them for whatever we use them for, um, energy? I think it's actually looking at them as an asset and... Um, That's right, Fiona, they're the multifunctional spaces. Mm. Can I make one point? I did hear a landscape architect say to me once that street trees create a canyon and that makes air quality worse. And can I just make a plea that everybody looks at the T guide, um, little guide called First Steps in Air Quality, that explains how that myth has developed and what it actually means. And generally, street trees can benefit air quality. The science isn't yet totally there, so you can say which tree delivers the best improvements in air quality or takes out the most amount of pollutants. But if anybody thinks that that is true, then please do check and challenge challenge blanket statements against trees because they're very easy to make and you know generally they're not true yeah so could i just make a quick comment on that i mean there's often the concern that trees emit um biogenic volatile organic organic compounds and they uh they mix they mix with nitrous oxide produce ozone which which obviously uh has uh, uh problems in terms of respiratory illnesses. And so that, that's been an argument not to have certain tree species. But we have to look to the future. We're going to be moving most nitrous oxide along roadsides is coming from vehicles. We're moving away from petrol and diesel. We're moving towards electric. And so, you know, that, that's probably not an argument. By the time these trees are mature and emitting these, these compounds, by then, hopefully, the vast majority of people will be uh, driving electric vehicles. So I think we should, you know, possibly argue against that, 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 uh, that argument against certain tree species. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to stop you. I don't want to. I think this is one of those conversations that could run on. Um, there's been some great questions. We haven't got to all of them. I am so, so sorry. I mean, the general, you know, Poor highways. Someone who put the highways always get a roasting in these uh, webinars. Mm. This is this is true. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who has some sympathy in terms of the the what what seems to be diametrically opposed responsibilities of the highways departments, which is delivering these great streets, but then to do it with no money and to prioritise um, things that perhaps don't really work. Um, 
I just want to say thank you very much for everyone who's participated. Sorry we didn't get around to all the questions. Um, I thought it was incredibly interesting. I've learned a lot from that. Um, so if people have got any other questions they want to ask, keep going, ask them directly to the Design Midlands crew and we'll, we'll try and field them as best we can. But panel, if you uh, just, just uh, remain to say goodbye and thank you very much for coming. And um, hopefully we'll be running another series of webinars soon and we can go into this in even, even more detail. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Cheers, guys.